all of you fathers here, and if you're watching online, happy Father's Day. This is an important day. Somebody uh, said something about uh, making a bigger deal about Mother's Day than Father's Day. But today, I want to make a big deal about Father's Day. I'm making a big deal about it. We honor every father here and every man who has taken the role of a father. Every stepfather, every grandfather, every uncle, every friend that has stepped in and done a father's job. We honor you today. We honor you today. And I think it's interesting and it's very, very important to take note that God calls himself father. The role of a father is not something light to take. It's not something that we can brush away and pretend like we don't need. And I felt it very important today. Now, I don't believe this myself. But our culture has tried to, uh, like, uh, lower the value of a father. And you've, you've seen, oh, well, a, a woman could do any job a man could do, or a woman can do the job as a father as well, or, you know, if, if, you know, if they're not going to show up, I'll do, I'll do it myself, kind of attitude towards fatherhood. And I just want to apologize, and I want to repent to every father that has felt disvalued, disengaged, left out, or in any way made to feel that your role as father is not important because it is important and we need you and we want you and we love you and we want to reconcile that broken gap that's happened between the culture that may be between uh, women and men or, you know, any time, type of a, a feminist mindset that you have received even in this society that we live in. And today, I want to, uh, I, I just want to reestablish the fact of how important a father is. And I, I, uh, I kind of studied for this message actually a couple of years ago. And, uh, and, I, and I always thought, you know, never was the right time to preach it. And whenever I heard that I was going to be preaching on Father's Day, at first, I was like, okay, Lord, and then he reminded me of something, and I want to start off today um, talking about how God calls himself Father, and then I want to go into something that I have studied, actually, for a couple of years, and I've just waited for the time, and today, today's the time. So the first time that God called himself Father was actually in Exodus chapter 4. And it was whenever he had come to Moses and he had told Moses, you're going to be the redeemer and you're going to go into Egypt and you're going to rescue my people from slavery. And what he specifically said, he said, go return to Egypt for all the men who sought you when you were younger are now dead. It's safe to go back. So Moses took his wife, his sons, he set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, See that you do all the, those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you're going to say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord. And I can only just, I mean, that I get chills when I think about, thus says the Lord. I can imagine the voice of the Lord telling Moses this. It ought to all make us all kind of shake and quake on the inside because of the power and authority as the Lord begins to say this to Moses. He says, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, this is what he's going to tell Pharaoh. I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And this is the first time that God in the Bible identified himself as father. He be, he's talking about my son. And whenever he says this, it is a position of authority. It's a position of ownership. It's a declaration of ownership. My son, this is my son. It is a declaration of war even, of violence. 
It is the protector. He is the redeemer. He's the reconciler. And what he said actually was very offensive. You don't let my son go, then your firstborn will be dead. He was declaring war, and he used Moses to say that. But he said, tell them, this is my son. That he, you know, God declared himself father at that point to free his people from slavery. To free them. It was a freeing, a redeemer, a reconciler position. And by the way, I just want to mention that God never calls himself mother. There is no female part here, a mother or mother earth or anything like that. God calls himself father. Matthew seven eleven says that if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? This was the perfect song to sing. He holds my hand. He, he takes that mountain down in front of me. There's nothing I'm afraid of because he holds my hand. I'm his child. I'm his daughter. I'm his son. Whatever you are, this is your father, and he is to be esteemed. A father is to be esteemed. I'm going to say that again. A father is to be esteemed. If God thought himself to call himself father, who are we to think any less or do any less than esteem our fathers? Highly regarded, respected, honored, influenced. Positions of influence. God called men to have influence among their children, among their peers. And if you look at today's society, how we know it's the last days because what men are saying, uh, good is evil and evil is good. And you see that in our culture all the time. And they want to denigrate and tear down the role of a man and the role of a father, the role of a husband in his family. But we, the church, we've got to take a stand today. We've got to take a stand. We've got to allow our men to lead their family. We've got to allow them to have influence with their children. We've got to allow them to fight for their families. We've got to allow them to be in that position of provider, protector, fixer, the repairer, the warrior, and the fighter. And fathers, we want to tell you today that we honor you, we love you, and we respect you. And we respect you and we love you because you discipline our children. Because you're good discipliners. Ephesians 6, 4 says that fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And I want to say to fathers, thank you for doing that. You show compassion to your children. Psalms 102, 13 says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. We thank you, fathers, that you show compassion. Your hearts are compassionate to your children. You show temperance and you show self-control. Colossians 3, 21, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. You take joy in your children, fathers, and you, and, and you teach them what, how to do right, and you take joy in them when they do right. Proverbs 23, 24, the heart of the righteous will gladly, greatly rejoice. He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. And we thank you, fathers, that you're confident in what you do. You're confident. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. You, you take your children, it says, and his children will have a refuge. You take your children and you build that confidence into them. We thank you, fathers, that you provide and that you work hard, that you're hard workers. You're not afraid to work. You get out there and work because it says that the Lord says that anyone who doesn't provide is worse than an unbeliever. And that's in 1 Timothy 5.8. You're a warrior, fathers. You are warriors with arrows to launch. You know, the word says that, you know, uh, uh, behold, children are a her heritage of the Lord. It goes on to say, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Why would the, why would the scripture even say that? 
because of, it's a father who has the, his quiver full of the arrows, and it's the father who can take him out and aim them and shoot them and launch those children as far as they can go. He can speak into their lives who they are, who they came from, what they believe. He can put the, their moral code into them. And we thank you, fathers, that you do that and you shoot these children like arrows far to launch so they accomplish what they were created to do. Fathers, we thank you because you become wise as the years pass. You grow in wisdom. You're loving. Just like Titus 2.2 says that older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, in steadfastness. So we honor our grandfathers and our older fathers. Fathers, you teach your sons, and your sons teach their sons, and their sons teach their sons, and you begin to establish your legacy. And we thank you, fathers, because you're working hard to establish that legacy. We thank you today. Proverbs 3 says, My son, don't forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. We thank you, fathers, that you do that. Proverbs 23 says, tells all of us, listen to your father who gave you life. And fathers, we thank you that you walk in integrity. Proverbs 20 says, the righteous man who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. You have established that line of demarcation that you're not a part of this world, you're not a part of this culture, but that you are maintaining what is right and you are, you are dispensing justice just as the Lord does. So we honor you fathers. Exodus 20 tells us, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord gives you. We honor you, fathers. I honor my father today. I honor my husband. He's a good father. He's a great father. I honor you, fathers. And so now I want to twist and turn this message, not twist it, but I want to turn it to the sons and the daughters, to the sons and the daughters. In Genesis 6, Starting in Genesis 6, it begins to describe the time, the days of Noah, and it's not really unlike today even. It says, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the Son of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. They took wives for them, and all they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, and yet his days shall be 120. And there were giants in the earth these days. And also after, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, and those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of the heart were only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man. He was sorry and he was grieved. And so he said, I, I'm going to destroy the earth. I'm going to bring a flood. A flood's going to come. But in verse 8, it says, But Noah, this man Noah, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I love what it says, verse 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, that means he practiced justice, and he was perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. This is a, a, a man that we need to study, and whenever it says that he was perfect, if you go and you break it down, it, it, it means he had integrity, that he was just, that he was lawful, he was righteous in all his ways, he strived to do the right thing. But the specific translation is very beautiful, and it is the title of my sermon, and it is a man who maintains the right and dispenses justice. A man who maintains the right. Now, maintaining something, you know, I, I'm not a very good mechanic, but I can tell you some about maintaining. You got to maintain a house. You got to maintain your car. You got to maintain your yard. If you ever stop maintaining it, then things go sideways, right? Things stop working, things break down. 
maintaining the right, maintaining right doesn't mean that you just stay in your little chair and that you do what's right for yourself, but maintaining right means that things are going to break, break down and fall apart. It's very easy to see in our society if we're left to ourselves with no God, if we're left to do whatever feels right or whatever is the YOLO at the time or, you know, we're just trying to be myself, you be you and I'll be me, that kind of attitude, then things begin to disintegrate and fall apart. And, but Noah here, it said that he was a man who maintains the right, maintaining something. Maintaining something takes some work, right? Maintaining things. That means that things get off course, you rein them back in. Whenever it kind of goes a little crooked, something breaks down, you are the fixer. You go in and you maintain it. You maintain it. You fix it. And he dispensed justice. And verse 10 says, And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now I'm going to end this, this uh, message up with Noah, but I want to keep on going. So God had commanded him, hey, the rain is coming. It's going to flood. I want you to build this ark. Here's how big you're going to build it. You know, they, however many football fields they say it is, it was a giant, giant uh, conglomeration of, you know, something that the whole neighborhood had never seen. In fact, the whole world had never seen. So here's Noah. He's building this thing. He's building the ark. He's obedient to the Lord because he walked with God. He walked with God. He said, gather your family. He says, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you're going to go into the ark, you, your wife, your son's wives with you. Now, Here's Noah building this, and uh, one thing I kind of heard maybe in Sunday school or I had this picture in my mind was that Noah was out there preaching. But it doesn't say specifically in Genesis that he was out there preaching. But what I, I try to wrap my mind around, he's out here in his front yard maybe, and he's building this thing, and I can just imagine the HOA or the neighbors begin to say, what is up? What are you building? So it was his actions out there that were preaching. And he began to build it, build this huge ark. And what's amazing about the ark, what's interesting to me about it, is that not was it just an ark, but it was, a, it was the salvation for anyone who was going to get in it. So it was the sermon and it was the salvation. It represented the curse that was coming and the salvation to get out of it, this ark. And, and I can just only imagine every day they're like, what you doing? No, no, what you going to do next, Noah? Where, how big is this thing going to get? But every day this man with his family are out there and their actions were speaking way louder than their words. It never says in Genesis that he preached. Now, later on, it says he was a preacher of righteousness. It was this big ark just sitting in the yard. And it was the warning, and it was the answer all in one. Uh, 2 Peter 2 and 5, it says, uh, that it, uh, it says, And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So, the message that this is bringing to me is how our actions are so much louder than our words on the sermon of righteousness. On the sermon of justice, our actions are so much louder than just our words. Matthew 24, it also says, as the days of Noah were, also will be coming the son of, uh, also will be so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. He did not and did not know until the day the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of man be. Hebrews 11 in the faith chapter, it says that by faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, but moved with a godly fear prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Now, I want to get back to Noah. 
in, in talking about what happened next, they went through this whole flood. They, you know, the water rise, and as you know, all the people on the land all died. And it, 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 I'm sure it wasn't pretty. I'm sure it was a violent thing. Everything on the land. So the animals were on the ark. Noah and his family were on the ark. And they go through their 40 days and 40 nights. And how, you know, all the time it took until there was land and the ark landed. And then it says in uh, verse 18, Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. And these three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be, become a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. And then he drank the wine, and he was drunk, and he became uncovered in his tent. Now here is this man of righteousness, this man who maintains right and who dispenses justice. And he had, had too much wine, and he became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and he told his two brothers outside. So somehow Ham stumbled into that and saw nakedness. And, and at that time, and really today, you know, seeing someone else's nakedness is a shame. And it's not right. But Ham took it upon himself to go out and tell everyone and dishonor his father. He could have done what his two brothers did next, which is they backed into the tent backwards with a blanket. They backed in, and then they covered their father without looking at him because they did not want to dishonor their father or shame him in any way, but took the most respectful approach to cover their father. But So there's something for us to learn in here and found out what had happened he, he realized what had happened. He, he, being this preacher of righteousness, this man of righteousness, who maintains the right and dispenses justice, saw that dishonor was not acceptable. And so he began to, to bless Shem and Japheth, the other two brothers. And he wraps it up with saying, And the son of, of Ham, Canaan, you will be cursed. And everywhere you go, you will be a servant to others. And my point in saying this is talking about dishonor. And we don't talk about dishonor enough, and we don't preach against it enough, but all you have to do is flip on the TV for a a couple of minutes and see the dishonor that goes on continually. Dishonor, dishonor, dishonor. And I'm talking about dishonoring people and men publicly even. And that's what I am, I'm preaching against today. Because if you go on to read, Canaan ended up being, uh, uh, all of the Canaanites, they were idolaters. They never served the one true God. They were evil in all of their ways and uh, disrespected the people of God over and over again. And eventually, that land of Canaan where we went in, you know, the, the Israelites went in and saw the, uh, the giants in the land and, you know, God, God had to go take that land. And Joshua is saying, do it, do it. Caleb is saying, let's do it. That was Canaan's land. Generation, generations down, many generations down. The curse went on generation and generation. And I want to talk about how powerful the spirit of dishonor is you can't lightly say words and dishonor someone and then go on and there be no no effect there is effect jesus even in his own hometown was dishonored and the word says that he could do nothing there he could do no miracles there and he left even jesus when he was dishonored could do no mighty works honor though it's it's not about the other person, or it's not about the other person so much as it's about you. And the same is with dishonor. Whenever you decide to honor someone, the honor is not something that flows off of the person that you're honoring. The honor is something that comes out of you to them. And the same with dishonor. It's about you. It comes out of you. And dishonor puts a spirit of isolation on you. Do you remember that? Uh, Miriam 
Miriam, Moses, and Aaron, whenever they, um, they uh, uh, Miriam and Aaron began to talk bad about Moses and began to have some grumblings going on because they didn't like his wife. And it really boiled down to they probably didn't like the color of her skin. But they began to grumble and complain and say all kinds of bad things against Moses. Well, God decided, I'm having no part of this. And he tells them, hey, all three of y'all, meet me at the tabernacle. Have you ever had your dad say, just wait till we get home? Because he had a plan. He's not putting up with that. You do not dishonor. And God calls us to honor. And what ended up happening, they met. And uh, in all of that, immediately Aaron seemed to start to apologize or start to, you know, say something. But Miriam, who really remained silent, uh, found herself covered in leprosy. And leprosy is a very, uh, you, know, it, you know, we don't have leprosy that I know of here in the United States anymore. But hopefully it's something that has completely gone away. I don't really study it because I, but I do know this one thing about leprosy is that it damages the nerve, the, your nerve endings. It damages like your, your central nervous system and the, the, it, it completely eradicates like your nerve endings. So eventually you have no feeling in this. And it's, so it's interesting that God put leprosy on Miriam whenever she dishonored her brother Moses and told her that you're going to have to go and sit outside of the, the camp for seven days. After seven days, she, she was healed and she came back in. But, you know, one thing that happens with that dishonor spirit is that you begin to lose your feelings. You begin to lose your respect. You begin to isolate yourself. And you may be isolated or self-isolate. And as you, you know, once you begin to dishonor someone, like if you go to work every day and, and you just can't stand your boss because they're not as educated or as experienced, they may be younger than you, they may be something about them that you just cannot stand but they're in a position of authority but if you start grumbling and complaining and telling everyone else something about that boss and running them down behind their back I promise you things are not going to go well for you they're not he's called us to honor those in authority and a spirit of dishonor brings isolation it brings isolation. And I want to wrap this up by talking and saying that dishonor, reminding you, dishonor is something that comes from the inside of you. And I've seen what I wanted to say in the very beginning of how our society has dishonored our men. Dishonored our men. And it has affected everything where we have not respected our men. We have not respected our fathers and shown honor to them, whether they were in a position uh, where they were uncovered, something was uncovered about them. But the Lord shows us very clearly in his word all through the scripture that we are to honor. And that doesn't mean that if there's a problem that you don't go to that person and say, we have this problem. You know, we, it, you know there's ways that are right, always right to fix a problem. But dishonor never brings a solution. Dishonor always brings evil into the mix every single time. None of us are perfect. We've all fallen short. We've all missed that mark. We're not perfect. So imperfection is here. Yes, we, we agree that that's here. But I'm speaking to those maybe who have dishonored a parent, Dis, or, or they have, they, maybe they've had a good reason to. They feel they've had a good reason to. The Lord wants to address that today and wants to heal you and wants to make this a day of reconciliation. And we've been talking a lot about reconciliation all over the place, all over social media, reconciliation, and a scripture that you have seen a lot, and I have seen a lot, and I hold very dear to my heart, is in Isaiah chapter 1. It says, put away the evil doings from before my eyes. That's not me talking. That's the Lord. Put away the evil of your doings before, from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless and 
plead for the widow. Now, one of the toughest words for me to even hear is the word fatherless. That word just breaks my heart. But how do we as the church defend the fatherless? How do we as the church plead for the widow? Do you remember how Noah, I'm taking you back, Noah was perfect in all his generations He was perfect in all his generations, and even in the next generation, there was some failure there. But Noah was perfect in all his generations because he was maintaining what was right, and he was dispensing justice. Y'all don't forget this. How do we defend the fatherless? How do we plead for the widow? We have to maintain what's right. That means when something is broken down, just like my car might break down, I got to call my husband to come and fix it. We got to see the things that are broken, and we, the church, have to maintain the right. We have to come in and see what is broken, and we have to fix it. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Every Every family and every generation doesn't have the legacy of Noah that he was a perfect man in all his ways and that he uh, perfect in every generation. I find all kinds of crazy stuff in my family. I heard of crazy stuff in families where things have broken down. But we've got to be the reconcilers to come in and maintain what is right and to dispense justice dispense justice. That is the beauty of the gospel that's been given to us. We've been called to bridge the gap. Maybe your family's perfect. Maybe you can go back every generation and see no breakdown and you everything is perfect in your life. But I'm telling you today, church, that there is a world of the fatherless and the widows out there and they need us to come and maintain what's right and dispense some justice for them. And that's bringing the gospel to them, bringing the gospel message that is the healing salve of God. It's the healing salve of God. And, you know, bridging the gap, you might find yourself part of bridging the gap, might be something uh, like I just want to honor my friend Tony Rory. He has an, uh, an organization called Men of Honor and Ladies of Honor, and they specifically go out and seek out children in broken homes that may be fatherless and may need someone, a father in their life and they have a program that just builds them up and teaches them character traits on the other hand right here at metro fellowship we have uh we're we're on the verge of starting a scouting group trail life american heritage girls and although all all boys and girls are invited there will be some that come that need a father figure And that's our job, is to dispense justice for this child and to maintain what's right. Go in and see what's broken and do some maintaining, some maintenance. That is the gospel. Fixing things that have gotten off course. The child can't fix for themselves. The young person, the teenager, even adults that are broken because of things that have happened in their lives. We, the church, are here to make perfect this generation, just like Noah did. And we can only do it by the blood of Jesus, with the power of Jesus, the authority that he has given to us because the Father has blessed us to do so. We've got to get things back in order, get things back on track. And today, I bless our men. I bless every man here. I bless every man that's watching And I thank the Lord for you. If you're here and you're watching today, chances are you're doing the right thing and you're keeping everything in order. You're defending uh, the, the fatherless and you're pleading for the widows. But we need to do better even. We could all do better, right? We could do better. So I just want to say a quick prayer and wrap this up. Father, I thank you for our men. This is Father's Day. And you may not have appointed this day, but we decided to participate in it because you're our heavenly father and you showed us what a real father is like. And Lord, we just want to thank you for our fathers. We want to thank you for the men who have been like fathers to us, who've stood for us, fought for us, defended us, protected us, provided for us. And we thank you for them today. And I just bless every man right now. 
every man under the sound of my voice. I bless you and I thank you for all that you've done. And you might have even stumbled a little bit, but you get back up and you go again and you try again. And that's what's beautiful about it. And that's, that's amazing. And I just thank the Lord for you. And I bless you today. Lord, bless all men today. Father, just let them have peace in their heart. Renew that warrior inside of them, God. We love to see that warrior in them. We love to see that protector and that fighter that fights for his children and fights for his own. And Lord, we just thank you for them today. We give you praise. We thank you, Lord, that you're calling all of us up to something higher, me included, to be better, to do better, to really maintain the right, maintain righteousness and, to, and disperse justice. Lord, we thank you for that today. And we give you all the praise. And we thank you that you are our Father and you show us the way. And we hold your hand, God. You're so amazing and you're so great. And we give you all the honor. Thank you, Lord. Amen.